that was an amazing day, an amazing set of talks. Thank you all for doing such hard work and bringing so much to the table. I think the, the, there is, the talks are already speaking to each other, so I, I barely need to do anything to, to moderate. Um, but I'll just sort of re recap. I think there's a series of different kinds of questions which are in the room, um, different ways of inquiring into architecture, whether we inquire into its mode of production or into the object itself, into the question of style or um, architecture as form, if somehow form opposes style, um, or into the way we practice or how we begin to understand um, where politics lies, more kind of theoretical questions, or even the way we begin to theorize our own disciplines still. Um, and uh, again, we kind of touch on the question of education. Um, I'll just, because this is so broad, I'll also try and recap um, sort of five different themes which I think are in the room on the table. Um, on the one hand, I think we, we've got um, a kind of questions of terminology that we could um, flesh out in terms of how we are all using the terms, similar terms, um, like agonism and the political, but perhaps using them differently. Um, I think, for example, um, Chantal's agon uh, is opposed to right-wing fundamentalism in a post-political age um, and aimed at taming uh, the political, whereas I think, um, Pierre Vittorio, your agon uh, opposes urbanization and the figure of sort of bad infinity and the kind of totalitarian sea of limitless growth. And actually, you seem to be giving form to the political. Um, so there's, I think, a very specific point of contrast and uh, contradiction there, which would be great to talk about. Um, the questions of style, I think, I've, I've already said, but they're, I think, very much in the air. Uh, in this as paper, um, it's wonderful to see postmodernism mm -hmm. as a form of um, dissidence. <laughs> and, and actually, that kind of work was quite similar to what was going on in the AA at the time. So it's, it's just a wonderful pairing of, um, of the figure of totalitarianism with whatever the, the figure of um, Thatcherism was or something in the AA. Um, so on the one hand, uh, your talk puts style really back onto the table. Um, but then there's the wor word of caution from uh, Pierre Vittorio that in a way, um, style is always co-opted um, and that uh, we have to somehow oppose uh, questions of style, or be suspicious of questions of style. Um, Sarah also um, very much uh, d made an argument for style, so that's a kind of theme we could talk about. Um, yeah, I'll just reduce these five to, f to four. The other two is the question of practice, uh, which um, I think at least uh, the question of dissidence is a kind of practice. Sarah is very much um, rethinking the nature of practice as projective, and I think the issue of practice contains this oscillation between the paradox of negation and engagement, and Chantal has very much embraced that question. And then finally, I think everyone shares the issue of uh, public space is sort of in the air as a topic, and Reinhold has very much challenged um, the, kind of the question of whether or not politics needs to be linked to a public, uh, or publicness. Um, and I thought it was very interesting the way um, Red Vienna kind of came up a couple of times um, in, in Pierre Vittorio's as um, the question of housing which opposes uh, the, the space of appearance, but the way uh, Pierre Vittorio, you, you presented it, it also includes a sense of appearance in the courtyard form and in the way um, the, how, the, the, you said that the class is, is um, represented. So there's a question of representation. Um, so we could start anywhere in this big field um, and it's so broad. So the question is like where to land and how to um, pick the kind of the way in to the debate. And I think uh, just because it's a kind of concrete point of opposition, I think it'd be interesting just to, to start on the question of the political um, as something we, we frame, we bring out, we expl explicate as a kind of experience. Or as, as Chantal said, that um, as soon as you begin to frame antagonism in the political, you're, it's a slippery slope to um, civil war, I think, I think you said so. No, 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 I wouldn't say that. I said that, that uh, it, it, uh, well, it, 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 if you, uh, uh, what, what I say is, is, is that a, soci a democratic society 
democratic pluralist society cannot be uh, uh, based on the fact that you are going to legitimize friend and enemy relation, uh, 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 type of relation. Uh, saying that, you know, the, the, because then uh, coexistence is not possible. That, that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that the, the, it's in terms of institution, in terms of how you organize a democratic society. I'm not saying that an, uh, 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 any form of referring to the friend and enemy outside lead to civil war because I, 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 that would be really uh, uh, absurd. You know, so it, it depends in which uh, form of, in, in which space you are going to. So there are spaces for which you are perfectly okay to define that in terms of friend and enemy, but not in terms of democratic institutions that they are going to organize our common life. That's what I'm asking. And maybe to put that to you, um, Pierre Vittorio, uh, this, this question of um, politics, um, and democracy. Uh, would you say you're an advocate of democracy? It's <laughs> <laughs> a trick question, why not? Like, I mean, like anybody else in this room, I mean, of course, I mean, um, um, I mean, uh, of course, there is also a question, you know, that today, uh, democracy has been reduced very often to basically an empty, um, an empty ideology that covers uh, rather aggressive uh, post-democratic uh, practices. So I think we should, uh, I mean, although of course we, we, I mean, we have to defend uh, the principles of, of, of uh, modern democracy, we should also be aware uh, that uh, today actually it has become really a Trojan horse uh, of very, um, sometimes very perverse strategies of winning consensus, for example. I mean, I, I think this is in architecture, in the practice of architecture, you know, very, I mean, values that we all share, like, for example, public space. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm a big uh, defender of the idea of, I mean, I completely, I mean, actually, I think uh, that uh, Reynolds' uh, warning about, you know, a certain kind of rhetoric of public space as the the only space of the political, uh, I completely, I think it was a very, I think it's a very important remark. Uh, I still remain, uh, nevertheless, I still, re I defend, I mean, I, I think that the idea of public space is still very important, even in its most, if you want, traditional uh, forms. Uh, but we know, uh, and for me, this is a very radical, I mean, this is a kind of a consideration that we always have to do, how today public space has been perverted as a kind of, Trojan horse for all kinds of uh, vested interest, and how often is a rhetoric that in architecture, urban design covers, you know, try to eliminate uh, fundamental conflicts uh, that are behind this kind of uh, formula, this, this idea of space that also the state uh, is no longer able to support and use it more as a kind of way to create this uh, uh, sort of jargon behind which uh, there is really no uh, uh, possibility of a truly political public space. So in that sense, I, I definitely um, still support those values that I think we, we seem to all share, although with, with, with certain, I think, clarifications that, for example, this distinction private versus public embodying the public space versus housing are distinctions that are no longer able to grasp the political dimension of the city. I completely agree with that. But still, we remain actually very strong in supporting the, 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 the possibility of a public sphere. Uh, but this actually has to come to terms with a very, for me, or a very explicit uh, condition that today uh, this notion of a public sphere is unfortunately used very often as a kind of fetish. Uh, that, uh, in fact, I would call, uh, I would uh, uh, sometimes the feeling that public space which actually makes, for example, developers usually very happy. I mean, when you talk with developers mm -hmm. and you have the strategy for a vibrant public space, of course, they are extremely uh, happy. And this actually, for me, signaled the fact that this category has to be radically questioned, but not, of course, thrown, thrown away. Uh, can I ask a question yes, here? Please. Because I, I, in fact, uh, uh, we, we did not mention that that uh, uh, concept to the neither of us. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, uh, 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 something which is very much discussed is the idea of the common, because in fact, and that's what I would like to. Uh, there are some people, uh, uh, 
who say, no, we need to abandon the idea of the public because the idea of the public is necessarily linked to the state and to, and to replace it by the idea of the common. The idea of the common is, is, is today really the, the and I, in fact, I would like to know uh, you as architect, what, what you think, think of this uh, uh, idea of, of the common? Uh, and will it be a way to, to, to uh, uh, precisely impede this kind of you know, negative conception of the public sphere? I mean, I, in fact, I want to ask you, uh, 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 Peritorio, about that. Well, because actually, uh, it's a very interesting question because I, I mean, my own sort of intellectual upbringing is very much in depth with people who have been the first to theorize this idea of the common and, and thinking even more than Negri, I think Paolo Virno and that, that kind of milieu of intellectuals that uh, now in the Anglo-Saxon world is known as post-operaist, which is a rather bizarre um, name, uh, but anyway. Um, actually, um, one of, um, and, and I've been, I mean, of course, the, the, in, the, in the 90s, when in fact there was a, a, you know, a major crisis, when the, actually the crisis of, this, of the state was becoming really explicit, uh, many theorists of this group uh, introduced this kind of concept of, of the common with, of course, different interpretations. I have to say that there are very different kind of definitions of the common, for example, between Negri, Virno, and, and others. Uh, um, and I have to say that although I recognize the productivity of this category vis-a-vis uh, -vis the crisis uh, of the states not being able to support anymore the idea of public space, uh, for me, one of the fundamental mistake, theoretical mistake, that has been made uh, by some of these authors, from my modest point of view, is to really think that there is a kind of mutual exclusive uh, relationship between common, the idea of the common, the idea of the public. I think this is a really, from my point of view, one of the biggest uh, mistake made within this theory of the common as something that has to replace the idea of, of the public. And in fact, uh, recently, Virno has made this point that this is uh -huh. a mistake uh -huh. Uh -huh. to think the common as something that a category that uh, can basically replace the idea of the public. I think the common. But he was arguing that very strongly before, so it's a real change. Well, I think that he was. Uh, I mean, yeah, was yeah, always yeah, yeah. less uh, enthusiastic. Yeah, but I've, I've got text of him that I quote precisely because I agree with you. Uh, uh, and in fact, I think the the, the question is is to. Uh, uh, um, well, if one envisages the, uh, the common as an agonistic public, that's what I've been my proposal to say, I don't have anything, but what, we don't need to abandon the idea of the public, but we can think of, if we think the common as an agonistic uh, public, then of course uh, that's fine, but, but they want precisely to reject well, the idea of the public. I, don't, I mean, I cannot argue on, on, on their behalf, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but I think that uh, one point that for me, uh, this issue of the common has made, uh, and I think it's a very important point, uh, which I agree, is to recognize uh, uh, from, especially from the point of view of political economy, because we shouldn't forget that the, the, the framework in which the idea of the common has been theorized is precisely from the point of view of production and how production today completely dissolved uh, basically these boundaries that the state have built within modernity, you know, private uh, versus public for example, cooperation and all this phenomenology of production. But still, I think uh, I agree, I mean, with you that um, a level of, you know, even if we want to defend this common as something that now today is actually both the main source of capital, but also the thing that is exploited by capital, I, I would agree with you that uh, in order to construct this, um, this let's say, counter, counter project of the common, we need a certain degree of representation. I mean, we need to rely on those, uh, let's say, categories that, in fact, uh, the very immanentist uh, analysis of people like, for example, Negri completely, uh, to a certain extent, reject. So I, I believe that there is, a, in that battle, in that, in, in that, in that uh, struggle, if you want, in that hegemonic struggle, a very vital needs of new forms of representation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that uh, the rejection of, of, of the public and the introduction of, you know, one of, by definition, the common cannot be represented. This is the fu fundamental dilemma mm -hmm. that we are facing. The common cannot have a form because the common is the totality of production. 
But in order to leave, uh, uh, to lever conflicts within the struggle of the common, we need some kind of uh, political form. And a political form can only exist if it's a public, public form. Can I bring Sarah or Ryan over anything on this? Well, I, I mean, I think that it, it makes me think of the, the Tocqueville quote where he says that, um, uh, what is it, that um, abstract terms are like empty boxes with false bottoms. You can pull out and take in, you know, put back in anything that you want. And I think that there's a, a side to that that's very important in terms of um, going back to understanding these terms of the public or, or the common or I would, I would actually like to to step back to the different discussion that you put on the table, because it, it seems that there's the need for uh, acknowledging that we have these abstractions, whether they're political terms or whether they're the abstractions of the, the space that we form as architects in the city, and that they uh, they take on different different terms, but that they they're. I mean, I, I, in other words, I think that there is still a kind of uh, irreducibility to those abstractions, of the, and that that's where the agonism lies. And so, for me, I do still see the um, that form of abstraction as being tied to the agonistic struggle. So, um, right, by abstraction, do you mean like the common as a very abstract? I was thinking more the public. I mean, I think I, I was. I, I I'm trying to digest the idea that you can't represent the the common because um, I'm not sure why, I mean, it's a, it's a totality, but I'm not sure why any abstract term can't be represented. If, according to that logic, it seems like very, there are a lot of things that couldn't be represented. And so, um, I mean, I do think that the, the question of, of terminology being tied to the, the challenge and the um, requirement for representation is key. In, in this discussion. I, I'm excited by the fact that it, it brings out different questions of representation, which I think you, you always um, bring in the question of representation in your discussion of artistic <laughs> practices, and I, I always want it to go one step further in terms of, okay, now what with that representation? So you put the question on the table, I think, in every one of the pieces that deal with artistic practices, but that to me is where, where we can move the discussion forward as long as it just doesn't stay two-dimensional representation as it, it also engages practice and, and what gets done. Maybe uh, if I think now with this comment, I would like to go back to Sarah's actually. In passing by, you were wondering what to make out of this uh, case in or the, mm. the square in Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder if uh, this could not also help us to identify where the problem lies. No? If, if it's already a question about the common or if it's about uh, the pu public and its kind of uh, embedded uh, uh, agonisms, uh, we might not find a kind of, we are also in question on how we represent that space, mm -hmm. not how you speak about it, right? So for you it was now in passing by, but on the other hand, there, uh, I mean, exactly for the kind of the uh, aesthetic uh, resonance chamber, no? <laughs> It's, it's about us as well in representing it in different ways, right? So it could be the photograph from above, it's the snapshot uh, mm -hmm. uh, of individual uh, objects on that square. Uh, but it might actually be a, a much more devoted project to actually represent and to find out how it works, how it functions. So that's also, I think, important for the architectural or urban practice in this case to to acknowledge the, the path to that project, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, to its continuation, its, its, its practice, its, its engagement still of the architect, of us reading it. So uh, your question was uh, short and I felt like I, I wanted to answer, I wanted to give it a yes or no, uh, but that's a problem, right? So because I think it continues in both in the practice of the architect, but also in our way of, of reading and um, acknowledging it, no? Um, it might disappear also, it might be rubbish in half a year because we might not find uh, the answers, the mm -hmm. appropriate arguments to call it uh, kind of the, the common that, that functions. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the Super Killen project, which I'm very conflicted about, is a very brave project, actually, mm -hmm. um, both for resurrecting a kind of postmodern 
appropriation, but and for the idea that you can identify these 60 different communities with one thing or one sign or one, one object. Um, and I would actually throw it back to you in terms of the examples of postmodernism. I mean, I do think that, that the, the examples that you show are examples that we read now through a very particular lens, I think, as, as Joseph was indicating. And how do we deal with that as, a, uh, as, you know, as the representation of, of what might be a, a political milieu? So. Yeah, good. Well, no, there's a lot to say, but... Um, I did want to get back to the dissidents for in, in a bit with a with a kind of example that might translate a little bit. But on the comments, since you mentioned it, uh, for sure there's a lot to say, and I think Pierre Vittorio has already said um, many things about this. But uh, you know, it's it's you know clearly this was a strategic move, and and in a particular context, and and uh, and that context has changed. So maybe that's why the moves are changing also. Uh, but ultimately, you know, there there is uh, there's probably something irreducible about the public commons um, problem, which which I've found occasion to think about myself uh, for a variety of I think related reasons. But um, the uh, just to, to to bring it really literally here. Um, which is, by the way, I did want to say that it's a pleasure to be back here. I have many fond memories of this room. Uh, <laughs> beginning with sitting where you are, where, where is a long time ago, when those works used to show up around here. Indeed. Yeah, I was here in 89. Um, uh, I was sitting listening to Mark Cousins. Um, well, he was able to smoke here in those days, uh, speak about psychoanalysis and, and space. Uh, so, and, and many times since uh, having a lot of fun here. So it's great to be back. Um, but, uh, you know, so that was actually one of the things that was being discussed here, uh, as I recall. But also, one of the other things that was very kind of present in, that I learned as an American coming here to Britain uh, to study uh, architecture and architectural history because I was in the graduate school, was the um, tradition of the country houses, which correspond directly to the historical genesis of this problem that we define as the common, because that's it. So this, in other words, and very concretely, if we were to try to more deeply explore this question, I think we have to historicize it. Not just back to Italy in the 60s and 70s, but you know, pretty much to, to, the, to the enclosure, that this is the sort of classic history at least, um, the, the enclosures to which the country houses correspond, uh, and to the transformation of agriculture in the British countryside to speak of production, the urbanization uh, of uh, of labor, uh, and and many of the things that, for example, Raymond Williams talks about in in the country and the city, which is a wonderful reference for this, uh, you know, the, as it were, the poetics. If we want to think about the aesthetic dimension of this, the poetics of these processes. Um, so, and, and you know, and, and one can I think follow that forward in a variety of ways to to in a sense demystify it a little, because I think that's one of the things that has happened with this category. It's acquired a, a kind of mystique. Um, but at the same time, acknowledge that there is an actual historical struggle going on around the 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 uh, the, the material processes to which um, this this now supposedly dematerialized uh, cognitive uh, you know you, the kids on the screens kind of aspect of the commons uh, refers um, immaterial production as I said. But I, to, to speak of immaterial production for a minute and to kind of try to connect a few dots. I, I, it occurred to me that, so you, you showed the Guggenheim competition, Pierre, uh, which you, you may know, ha there's another competition out there um, run by a group called Gulf Labor uh, and with Michael Sorkin and a few others, and, and that who sometimes, the Gulf Labor sometimes affiliates with a group called Who Builds Your Architecture, uh, who's in, 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 uh, based in New York, and who have, have been contesting in a sense, the, the premise on which the Guggenheim has been doing what it's doing and the role of architects in you know, perpetuating that. Um, uh, and so there's a counter competition, in other words. So if that's hegemony at some level, there, there is an, an a, you know, and I think probably we would have to associate that closer to the tradition that I think Inez was trying to, you know, and I think very effectively because architecture has always had this problem, uh, you know, it may not be specifically a strictly political architecture in the sense of forming a polity out of these dissident projects, but the paper project, the counter project, 
and a place here of, of, of many, you know, of all places, in fact, has been, this has really been a home for such kind of work, um, is, 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 a, is a sort of genre that, that I think many of us still would like to imagine has a certain agency. And certainly uh, our friends and colleagues who were, you know, doing this kind of basically activist work to, to challenge the uh, professionally, it's actually quite professional, the Who Built Your Architecture uh, group has, has, has meetings, public and private meetings, with, with professionals uh, who are, you know, big, from the big firms to the, to the boutique firms, working with uh, the, um, uh, the, the kinds of clients who are employing essentially um, uh, slave labor or, or indentured labor in, uh, in, in many parts of the world. So, you know, there are, and, and this is where the question of representation does come in as a potentially active aspect of architecture. We don't have to call it representation in the sense of like making, like representing something and therefore participating in a metaphys metaphysics of presence in that sense, but, but, but uh, of, of discursively contesting uh, the, the, the terms and the premises. And, and the last thing I think that's worth saying and where the, 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 the you know, literal imprisonment, the disappearing of, of the, your protagonists, the, the, the you know, expulsion, uh, the, the imprisonment of, of, of these uh, figures, I think is meaningful, is that, you know, in most cases of architectural contestation and dissidence, this isn't the case, but, um, but there, it does actually remind us that, that in this public sphere such as it is, certain things can and cannot be said at any given time. This is an extreme instance in, in which there are dire consequences. Uh, but actually, the, what's being made clear in contesting things like the Guggenheim uh, enterprise is, is that there are a series of assumptions surrounding architecture's cultural, political, economic status that structurally exclude, hegemonically, other statements. Uh, and, and so this, these are you know, ways of, as it were, speaking in, in public uh, that, that don't presume that, that that sphere is available uh, because it actually isn't available structurally if one wants to say certain kinds of things. Um, yeah. I think um, that sort of speaks to uh, an issue of truth, of um, let, let's say architecture bringing to the fore, bringing to light um, something that's repressed or concealed. Um, and I think, I think Pierre Vittorio put this nicely in saying that architecture was um, the paradoxes that there's a, the, between conflict and consensus. Um, so it's always seems to, in, in your description, uh, be sort of trapped in a kind of, cons uh, a cons the consensus conceals, and the question is how to bring to the fore. And you, and you, you put um, the, um, something, something common, or even I would say like maybe the political stands in for this unrepresentable common and in trying to bring that to the fore. And also, I think, in his, uh, the, the role of, um, the, there's a kind of common that's at play in dissidents, just in the sense, the way the dissident movements <coughs> mobilize an idea of the, hu the human um, and human rights. And you mentioned um, Charter 77. Mm. Um, so, so you always need, you need to somehow figure um, a common, you know, something common, like, the, like human rights or the political. And there's always a kind of gap like Sarah, mm -hmm. you spoke of this kind of gap of representation. But then the question is, is, is the paradox of how you represent it. And Ch Chantal, you used the phrase in terms of speaking of the common, common uh, symbolic space. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, and but, that's, that which yeah, but that could have said a shared symbolic space. This is what course, I mean, mm -hmm. because, you know, no, it's not the common, it's, it's a shared symbolic space. <laughs> well, I wonder if um, one way around this paradox is just the observation that um, the common is plural, um, and that every interpretation, every attempt, it's always particular. There are particular commons, and therefore everything's an interpretation. Um, and you yeah. never make the claim yeah. that there's yeah. one yeah. Uh, <laughs> graspable yeah. stake on the political or the human or, um, yeah. Would you like us to? <laughs> yeah, that was an interjection, not a question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I, I could say things about representation, but no, I want to hear them. Well, I, um, I mean, speaking about consensus, I mean, for me, um, I mean, uh, this is really, the, for me, the fundamental problem of, of not architecture today, but really 
the whole theory of architecture. And, and actually, of course, I mean, I'm not uh, talking about mm, you know, practical consensus. Of course, in order to, to share a space, to, to live together, basically, of course, we have to, to develop some form of consensus. I mean, I'm not uh, saying consensus uh, is, is bad, is something we should uh, disrupt. No, I think that there is a level of consensus that I think any political form, uh, even the most uh, democratic, uh, requires. So I completely, the problem of architecture is that architecture is not just being a means of mm, consensus, but really sometimes the embodiment of what I call, uh, in my own terms, the ideology of consensus. Mm -hmm. And for me, the ideology of consensus is something I mean, very different because it's not just um, the practical consensus that it's, you know, uh, but it's really this sort of, um, it's not celebration, but really almost uh, the conviction that there is no alternative to a situation of stability and order. And I think, for example, the reason why I wrote Vitruvius is because for me it's amazing that the beginning and the end of the, the, Archite the Architettura Libridation, the 10 books of architecture, starts both with, I mean, they, 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 it, it starts and it ends with an image of conflict. I mean, the first image of conflict is his dedication to Augustus, uh, where he recognized in a very um, subtle way how Augustus come to power to pacify, basically, the, the, the empire. And the last uh, uh, image of uh, the Architettura is the, the, the siege of Mar the, uh, Marsene, the, the ancient Marcel, the last, actually, polis in the Mediterranean, uh, which, um, in a way symbolize the possibility of architectural knowledge to put, to put, put into practice into, into win basically a conflict. I mean, the, the, the last part of the architecture is actually about war machines. Now, for me, this is really interesting because in between these two images of you know, unavoidable conflict, uh, uh, of, of the, you know, uh, the whole rhetoric of the architecture is really built on this, you know, what Leon, uh, Leon Battista would call the edificatoria, the, the idea of building, the idea of which is not just building buildings, but the idea of structuring an ethos where, in fact, conflict uh, is basically eradicated uh, and, and where a certain stability is actually uh, achieved. No? And you can almost trace a line from Vitruvius to, to Le Corbusier, but even to, I mean, until, until recently, uh, architectural theory has always been uh, really an embodiment of this rhetoric of, you know, of, of Reconciliation. But, I mean, of yeah, but you say consensus. I mean, couldn't we say also order? Yes, but it's not just order because order is, in a way, a, a very, especially in, uh, in, for example, in modernist architectural theory, is a word that was already considered uh, too strong or too aggressive. Um, so, in that sense, you know, there are many architects who are very subtle to evoke this idea of order and stability with the idea of, of pacific. Coexistence. Now, I mean, architecture is reap of representations of the city where everything, you know, is um, peaceful and, in a way, I mean, we, you know, where, where everything is 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 smooth. No, and and I think that this is for me really the problem of architectural ideology. Let's say, I mean, what you know, my friend really once called architectural ideology. Of course, uh, since uh, in the 70s, we have. A development of what we, you can call critical practices within architecture. So in a way, uh, which uh, it's a very recent tradition. I mean, uh, I think that only in the late 60s you, you had architects, in a way, questioning radically the very mandate of architecture. Uh, but uh, this, uh, in fact, always happened uh, outside of institutions. Within institutions, or within, let's say, the labor what I would call labor-intensive architecture. I mean, the architecture that uh, is produced by big practices or, you know, let's say people that, in a way, built, uh, built our environment. There is this ideology of consensus is still very strong. I mean, I can mention one, for me, astonishing uh, uh, example uh, of this, uh, which is the case of an Italian architect who uh, most of you, and, and this is not a personal critique, it's a critique really on the phenomena that this architect <laughs> represents. Uh, so please uh, don't uh, take that as a, as a personal critique, but I'm, I'm really interested in the, in the situation. 
There is a very important, and actually very intelligent architect called Stefano Boeri, who actually in the, in the 70s uh, was very much involved in, uh, in political struggle. I mean, he is actually he one of the few. He wanted to be uh, mayor of uh, yeah. He's one of the few, few architects uh, who actually has a, a, a real engagement with politics. Yes. So one of the few who can really speak of how to be an architect uh, and also a political uh, agent mm -hmm. no? within institutions. And uh, very few years ago, he was um, um, commissioned to, uh, by Highness. Uh, I don't know if you know Highness. is one of the... Uh, Heinz. 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 Yeah. What is yeah. the Heinz? What uh, is it's one of the biggest uh, developers in the world. Yeah. Uh -huh. One of the biggest uh -huh. real estate developers in the world. Uh, he was commissioned to design uh, residential towers in a place of Milan called Porta Nuova. And it's uh, a, a, a former working class uh, district, which is because it's very near the central station. Of course, it has become uh, a, a very, let's say, a real estate. It has attracted a lot of uh, real estate interest. And in spite of the fact that I think Boer is a very refined and subtle uh, intellectual, um, he actually had a design. Uh, I mean, these towers has to, are two high-rise building for extra luxury uh, mm -hmm. apartments. Mm -hmm. So the most, uh, you know, it's not even gentrification. It's really pure, almost military occupation <laughs> of the city. So we are beyond gentrification. There is still, there is still some subtleness, no? There is still stuff. But this is really like he just, uh, there are two towers, like, you know, San Gimignano, you know, the Fusca, you know, right in the middle of the city. And uh, although he's a very subtle and intelligent critic, uh, the, the proposal is actually uh, like a very bizarre to me at least, maybe I'm the only one to find it bizarre, almost crazy uh, idea, which is, is to uh, clad, literally clad these towers with trees, mm -hmm. but not tree, uh, the fake trees, real trees. Real trees yeah. um, of course, that was the only way, uh, only way to uh, create consensus. Mm -hmm. So here this is for me, I mean, maybe it's the most, uh, the, less, the less subtle example I could give, but I was really struck how someone who has a, a very uh, interesting discourse Someone who had a very interesting background, who is a, I mean, he, he has written a lot and, and very interesting stuff, could actually, uh, you know, in order to perform his role as an architect, he had to basically uh, adopt this, for me, absolutely, uh, cons you know, you know a kind of consensual strategy that was almost over the top. Just a little question. Is that where the Isola project Yes, the Isola, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually, can I, I jump sure, in just no, really quick? Because I'd like to ask a question about this issue of consensus, and I'd like to aim it back at Chantal. Because I, I'm, when you say that you're, you're, what was it, that you're surprised by the, that architecture is, is sort of always reproducing a form of consensus, in, in the agonistic model that you lay out politically, um, agonism implies a respect for the adversary, but it also does imply that you think you're right, right? Well, in other words, you, there's... You, are right. you want to win. Right, the, you yeah. want to win, <laughs> and that you... So there's a... there's a, And because you think you're right, right? So that there's a... And that, that you believe that others will buy into your game. It, thinking as an architect, that is, that, that it seems that there's a... There's a level of consensus that's obligatory to the... Let's say the hubris that goes with any architectural proposition of constructing something that will organize other people's lives. And so my question for you really is um, this, this question of uh, to what degree is there, I mean, you can, you can have a belief in a model of consensus knowing that it might get displaced. In other words, knowing that there's a, uh, there's a potential battle down the road where another adversary may win, but there's, it seems like consensus is something that we all traffic in politically or architecturally, uh, and that there are degrees of consensus that we have to actually parse for yeah, this yeah, discussion no, to be valuable. No, I, I, sorry, maybe the question was with Chantal, but I, I think there is a level of consensus that is... <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it depends, yeah, yeah sure, but, but let's say it's, it's, you want to win over the majority to your position, so in a sense, yeah, but, but why knowing that, uh, um, it's something, 
I mean, the problem is that uh, I, usually when I think of consensus, I think that a way to consensus is reconciliation. Of when mm. we, and, and here is not, no, you know they won't be. It's a question of winning yeah. uh, against an adversary, you know? Uh, but in order to win, you need to, to, to convince, to persuade people right. that this is, I don't like this idea of being right because in fact the idea of truth is something which I completely reject and I think it's very dangerous to think sure. the, the, the idea that is you have got the truth. But you, well, you think that your project is, is uh, uh, it's a good project that it could uh, uh, really, really uh, make people, you want people to identify with, right. with this project, you know, and of course, uh, uh, but, but yeah, you can call that to create some consensus, but I, I would not. I would say it's, it's almost like a temporary case. consensus. I mean, well, it, or or at least this this persuasion. It's not just that you're thinking you're the only one who's right, but that that. And I think right. I mean that yeah. you have a good proposition, whether yeah, it's a yeah. political one or whether I, yeah. I agree. It's not. I'm not trying to advocate for truth, but mm -hmm. but. Um, I, I do think that there's a degree of persuasion and, and consensus that's, that's um, quite operative, especially in our field. So, yeah, but um, I think we might have a hard time. I'm think, I want to actually return to the question of representation for a minute because it, it is in, in, important, but it may, this may be a little oblique. Uh, I, this, I have some very literal examples if anybody wants, but this is more oblique. Um, and again, it, it refers to some of Inez's examples. Uh, you know, protagonists there, because what, what I think slipped a little to the side was the possibility, the, the, the fact that these were not just, that they weren't, they were strategically appealing to the human rights protocols, but they were, they identified still as socialists. So I'm getting to this sort of second part of the title, hegemony and socialist strategy, the, because I think we could have a lot of fun discussing what a democratic architecture would be today. Mm -hmm. It would be a lot harder to get, not, not consensus, but even to the table, the question of what a socialist architecture would be. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, which is what these guys were effectively posing still. It's, uh, that's at mm -hmm. least how I read th those projects. It's not a Soviet uh, model. Uh, it may, may or may not be Red Vienna, but, but it's, it's a, uh, still in, in that case an avowedly socialist. Uh, it, there was, you know, the example of the Red Bauhaus that you alluded to with Ernst May is another one that became actually a diasporic uh, um, one. Uh, it, it, very, very interesting. I have a, a, learning this from a PhD student of mine, Daniel Telesnik, who's, who's writing on the Red Bauhaus. It, it travels to Chile. There's some of these various figures. It isn't just May. It's, just, it's Meyer and his, his, his little cell, that, which is the reason he got kicked from uh, the Bauhaus in the first place, as you, yeah, you know. Uh, and it's, it's her, her people, basically, these, no, yeah. these dissidents. But, um, but they, well, you know, in Mexico, in, in Chile, and so on, founding and uh, contributing to, to, to developments there. Uh, usually, you know, in relatively, uh, you know, ways that, that were, I wouldn't call them minor, but they were, they've been invisible to history so far. Um, so there's a recovery effort with these kinds of projects that's, I think, very, very important for us to even to get to the point of being, being able to, to, to say, uh, without being kicked out of the room, is there a socialist architecture? Has there ever been or could there ever be in, in any way? Uh, that, and, and in, you know, where I teach and work, that's a very difficult thing to say. Uh, you, you know, well, I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah. if Look, our book was published in yeah. 18, yeah, I know, 18, I know. So historically, yeah. honestly, if yeah. we were going to write it today, well, I would yeah. not. Yeah, be right. I know. So, uh, so, socialist right, right, right. More, so, know, because it, it the, the things have changed so much. But at right. that moment, it was the question, and we right. wanted to redefine social and yeah. democratic democracy, and it was a battle, a, a real battle. Uh, but today, it, it it will have to be posed in different ways. Right, right. And you know, and obviously, there are many people working on vocabularies and counter vocabularies and so on. But, but for example, uh, to, to get back to the more concrete, uh, you know, one of the reasons that for me housing is, is meaningful is it because it raises the specter of the state in its various capacity, various dimensions, you know, vis-a-vis -vis public and all that, but also who's paying for it, land, all, all of these, as it were, structural things. Without, you know, for these very reasons, without, unless we're very nostalgic for, for models that have, you know, dissipated, uh, allowing us uh, to, um, especially when you make it concrete in architecture, uh, to, to settle for some old statist kind of uh, thing. Um, and, and, then, and then especially when, when one recognizes that the state in its classical modern form 
uh, is only one scale of, of hegemonic uh, production. Uh, and right now, what we, many of us are contending with is, for example, the thing called China, which is not China. It, it is a series of articulations uh, that, that people like Giovanni Arrighi are, are, have argued uh, constitutes a potentially counter-hegemonic global model uh, to that that has been more or less supervised by the United States after the Cold War. So, you know, then, and architects are going around the world reproducing this, uh, this uh, apparatus. And, and it would help us to think, first of all, what is it that architects are reproducing, the Bjarke Engels symptomatic uh, you know, version, uh, or, and or what counter models uh, could, be, um, could be imagined, at least, or articulated, that would, would be uh, legitimately the successors of these historically socialist projects, uh, with or without mm -hmm. that vocabulary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd, I'd just like to interject, just to okay. invite questions also oh, from the so. audience. Because um, I'm aware we, oh, we, yeah. so we, we like to They're talk. all here Yeah, too. we have a lot of people who've stayed all day. <laughs> okay, and, sorry, um, we'll let them talk. We've got two roving mics, mic so just raise your arm. Yeah. Um, and, I'll, and I'll keep a record if you yeah, yeah, raise your yeah, arm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Hello. Uh, I wanted to return to the question of truth for a moment. Maybe we can put it in terms of a norm rather than a truth. That's a less scary word, maybe. Of what? Uh, a norm, a norm a rather norm. than a truth. Oh, that's an even scarier yeah, word. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, I agree. So as Chantal said, uh, agonistic ontology is, of course, not a left-wing ontology because it has no norm. And in a sense, it guarantees the legitimacy of different positions. Um, for architecture, this kind of meta-politics meta is attractive and accessible because it lends itself to a kind of formalism. However, how do we escape the accusation of sophistry or relativism if we have no norm? How can architecture, as Reinhold was just asking, how can it be radically political and not just political in the weak sense of having no specific content or just being a play of force without without norm, without truth, without militancy. That's directed to Well, to the architect, yeah. because yeah. I mean, I can't... <laughs> 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 I use the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to answer this? Um, I mean, I think I, I would argue that, that um, I like the, the node or uh, that model that Chantal referred to and is also in the Boltanski and Chiapello the, the sort of sense that there are moments of a fixity to our system of that exists and that you make a proposal and that, mo that proposal is a moment of fixity. And I think that every project offers up its own norm or its own proposition, right? But I, I think that the, um, what I, where I got nervous was the, the slip in your question of, of slipping in the, the sort of term of only formalism or sort of empty formalism. and I, I, I don't understand what you're what you're referring to there in terms of um, I mean part of what I think we um, always have to understand is if you don't uh, if you don't bring form into a discussion of how architecture engages politically then you're um, uh, pretending that that we don't traffic in limits and in delineations and so um, the fact that form has been maybe co-opted by a certain camp doesn't mean that we shouldn't use that term. So I sort of throw the question back at you, but um, I'm not, I think uh, norms, it's a, a question of you, you make a proposition with the assumption that someone else understands your proposition, whether it's a consensus, probably not, but at least you assume that you have some fellow travelers who are gonna come on board with you. Um, whether that's establishing a new norm I wouldn't go that far, but it's establishing a, a, at least a, a moment of, of a node or a, a proposition that will advance our field. When, when you say content, um, the, the word content, is, it this, is this a question that's um, sort of what ideals or what vision or um, what ethos, like a vision of the good life, like what drives or guides? Um, Well, in the, in the example of Red Vienna, you can read a kind of formal strategy. Uh, and I'm, not, I'm definitely not saying form should be abandoned, since it's obviously integral to architectural work and practice, et cetera. 
Uh, but, but there's something political in the Red Vienna Project which is not definable according to the domain of formalism or right. to, to its formal register. And in the, in the way we've been discussing the political in its, in its meta-political ontology, uh, agonism has, is kind of equivalent to the sense of the, red, of the formal register uh, within which distinctions become available mm -hmm. to maybe the, the inhabitant of the city, et cetera. Uh, but what are the actual motivating politics of engaging formally? What are the, like in, in the case of Red Vienna, what were they actually trying to do? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, for me, it's a very uh, unique project. Uh, first of all, um, it was advanced by uh, a group of people who were renegades uh, within the more orthodox traditional uh, history of Marxism. Huh? They were social democrats who, as you might know, has been always very dis despised actually by traditional Marxists because actually they, accept, they accepted the ground of liberal democracy as, as the ground for class struggle. Um, and in fact, for me, this, this condition is very much embedded in the project because they, well, they were forced to accept uh, the, the given rules uh, uh, which they couldn't change because they were uh, in power only within the city, not at the level of the state. Uh, at the same time, within this ground, they actually try to win. I mean, by rely on the partial interest of the class they represented, uh, which for them was actually a truth, uh, you know, a, a profound motivation. Nevertheless, they accepted that in the political struggle, uh, you know, this truth was not uh, something that they could uh, put in the middle, uh, but they could only, they had to accept this kind of adver adversary uh, nature of the struggle, the enmity as a, and actually they exploited the enmity as a way to reinforce basically their project. So in that sense, uh, I, I found it very interesting because um, it was an alternative, for example, of strategies for socialist architecture put forward, for example, by people like Hannes Meyer. Hannes Meyer really wanted to completely engineer uh, a socialist uh, uh, life uh, where uh, you know, everything you know, would be organized according to the principle of, of, of socialism. Uh, while actually in the Red Vienna there is, a, there is a level in which the struggle is accepted as part of the, of the form of the project itself. It is actually instrumentalized as a way to construct also the motivation, the ethos, the impetus of, of, that, of that particular class struggle. So for me, it's really a project that really escaped both the totalizing uh, aspirations of realist socialism on one hand, but also the value-free relativism of you know, what today is called acupuncture mm -hmm. uh, architecture. In this you look like you were going to... Acupuncture, sorry, it's a, it's a, a typical architectural jargon. Uh, uh -huh. yeah. so it's putting, putting in small... Small, small, moves, small interventions say. that, uh, uh -huh. in a way, do not... Barely visible. Like that thing that that small apologies. Yes, yeah, small apologies, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Now I feel I still have to respond to the uh, socialist uh, uh, kind of architecture uh, uh, point and thanks for, for kind of framing it and probably better than I can do it. But like the way I, I came to this project also on the dissidents was sort of out of the, of, out of the research or kind of looking at the, the history of uh, architecture and urbanism um, of, of, of the socialist uh, era, uh, state socialist era which I think still uh, would probably work as a socialist democracy, right? So it's, yeah. we don't speak, I wouldn't see it as a kind of a totalitarian and therefore it wouldn't fit into the category. So there's, there's democratic structures and uh, I think also a conflictual struggle here um, that uh, architects had to practice on a daily level. So what actually didn't fit ever in my kind of work in, of reading this history were the kind of the less known uh, reform movements, you know, things which which couldn't be, they were not 
either not big enough so that one could uh, clearly articulate them as such, uh, or they disappeared, or they were really hidden in daily practices of where you, which, which is also natural to the architect's work, right? To, to contest, to, to, uh, to argue, no? So, so it, it's very difficult to actually to read it in a kind of a spectrum of practices. So where you have extremes between the very little known and the kind of the, so for me the most extreme example is the, the architects who went to prison. Uh, but at the same time it was also to, to, uh, to figure out a kind of a, a toolbox of uh, a visual, artistic, uh, creative practices that are not necessarily the project, right? Or like which have an, an architecture that made it so fascinating because that became also the 80s, right? Or kind of the, the postmodernist uh, attitude to uh, to enjoy sensuality of of, uh, of space, of drawings, of uh, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, discourses that would exactly not be political, right? And so. The, that's also how they were read so far. And I was actually trying to bring them back into a political, <laughs> uh, because otherwise they would just, and I think this is also how they were invited here, the mm. paper architects from, from Moscow to present here. I think this was in 88, right? Uh, in 80. Um, uh, I, I think it was much more so to, to uh, the curiosity, no, of what comes from there. But uh, I think to uh, the kind of the, political con context of struggle, of danger, the precariousness of these uh, uh, projects uh, was not properly assessed. And I think that's it's also, it's just a, a kind of a field also in which other practices can add to. No? There was a question in the middle. Yeah, there's over there. Yeah, that's okay. Hi. Uh, I wanted to um, ask about a, a, another dimension of architecture, which I think uh, in the discussions today, which were all uh, really fantastic, um, has rema remained in the background. And that's really the dimension of time within architecture. Uh, uh, especially, I mean, we've discussed the kind of spatial dimensions of architecture, uh, of architects, of politics and the political. Uh, but within the struggle against uh, neo-capitalism or neoliberalism, I mean, one of the things that that uh, system uh, does so well is that it relies on perpetual immediate crisis uh, or uh, antagonism and in order to preserve a long-term fundamental restructuring of social power relations. Uh, so it, it would seem to me that the dimension of time is really one aspect also that distinguishes architecture from other forms of artistic uh, discourse. Um, and in answer to uh, something you said to Chantal about revolutionary architecture, I mean, I would argue this point that there is no revolutionary architecture. And I would say that if we were to look at La Défense or we were to look at Canary Wharf or actually more importantly, uh, Reinhold, if, I think housing is really the best place to look at this. Uh, Le Mouet, uh, Haussmann, or even the invention of the terrace row in, in Britain uh, without going back as far as enclosure. I mean, these are all forms of revolutionary architecture which only unfold as spatial and temporal formulas um, uh, uh, through uh, time. And, and in that sense, I would argue that architecture is not principally about building at all so much as these, these formulas. Uh, and maybe just to sort of conclude on that point, is it perhaps because of Engels' housing question, which uh, still in a way has the shadow of 1848 embedded in it, uh, that housing has become a kind of blind spot within uh, the, the formulation of the socialist project through architecture? That seems to be to you, right? Now. Um, well, yeah, no, that's an interesting comment and, and question. I would I completely agree with you if I understand your your point about la défense etc is that these are structurally transformative and in that sense revolutionary totally agree in fact I'll tell this little story that I was there's a small there's a kind of Marxist cell we, we could call them in New York <coughs> called platypus uh, who, who did a little panel uh, this what they're here too I don't know maybe they're here but um, they did a, a panel a couple of years ago called architecture and revolution or something like that uh, in which um, they invited, for some reason, Peter Eisenman, 
uh, myself, uh, Bernard Chumi, and John Ockman. And, uh, and I, I, it was in a room at NYU that, that it was designed, I forget, by Vignoli or one of these, you know, people. And, 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 I, and there was, the, you know, they put us in this question, so is there a revolution in architecture? And I, I, I said, yes, we're in it. Uh, for these reasons, and and of course Peter had he, he completely <laughs> I think had no idea what what the implication was, but he, he of course felt the need to disagree, um, and the so you know I'm completely agreeing with you. The question then, in that sense, you know, for those of us who object to these uh, this state of affairs, could be what would be the counter revolutionary or, or, or vice versa, however you want to frame it in terms of these. Uh, these kinds of um, uh, tra transformations. Uh, on housing, um, yeah, y although, you know, housing, uh, like I think I said, I, is, is, a, is a kind of the classic place where architects tend to look for politics and, and tend, to, you know, you, or, or at least for social responsibility and things like that, that, you know, it's the place where society enters in most traditionally in architectural education. Like, for example, at Columbia, we have a housing studio uh, where, where people, it's one of the few left that where they teach housing in, in the second year studios. And that has traditionally been where, you know, you're supposed to be sober and, and responsible. Um, and I think, you know, the, the sharper edge that I think you're, you're implying, and I would again certainly agree on that, would have to do with, to some extent, the historicity. If, if I would translate your question of, of time at a num in a, into a number of different registers. One of them would be the historicity and hence the persistence of, like in the, the tendency in a different way to return always and repeat uh, these neurotically, uh, the, these problems, always with a difference. So, so for Engels, you know, the, the, the housing actually wasn't a solution to anything because for him it was more or less superstructural and really the relations of production were what was at stake and that was the debate with Proudhon that the housing question was about. However, there is something in that debate that I think we could, we need to return to. There are many things there, but one of them would be in that that debate with Proudhon, the um, and the relationship not just of ownership, because that's what it, it, it's about ownership versus pro proletarianization and collectivity, but uh, but also the, um, the 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 expectation in a sense that the home or the house was the site for the production of and or the interruption of class consciousness uh, and a certain subjective uh, life and, and perhaps political project. Uh, that, that intuition, in a way, I think is very much alive and, uh, and, and, and in a sense you could say is one of those ghosts that, as Derrida used to say, always tend to haunt us. And, uh, and it's one of architecture, specifically uh, the specters of Marx and Engels in this case. Uh, who uh, that haunt us? Uh, I think rightly so. Uh, here we need to clarify something yeah, because yeah. when I said that, I was quoting you. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. And, Sorry. And, and, <laughs> Sorry. And, 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 and wait a second, I said there is no that is yes, Reynold yeah. Martin yes, writing. Uh, there is no such thing, <laughs> however, as a revolutionary architecture. Right. And and I so I think of course it depends in yeah. what sense you mean. Yeah, it. I meant exactly. it. That was yeah, that yeah, was from yeah. I think the piece on Occupy. I yeah, believe yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. where the, the call was for a revolution. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah. So, so you need to yeah. clarify yes. that. Uh, I, I, I will. Yes, you, yes, absolutely. You're right. Uh, 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 I'll do that in just in, for, in one <laughs> sentence or a couple of sentences because uh, because that was in the context of um, and, and I stand by that for sure uh, of the question of, of in the in the moment of uh, organized uh, um, dissent. Uh, what architecture's role was, and and it, it, that was the point about the day after. In a sense, it seems to me that w where architecture can be most effective is to enable. Um, there's al there was always going to be a, a day after the revolution. I mean, I'm not just literally like 1918 rather than 1917, but but uh, but in in the imagination. In other words, it's related to this point that's been you know that that's been made that, that both Sarah and Chantal made about the project. Um, what constitutes, what are the institutions, how, how to imagine the institutions, uh, as it were, of this new society. Um, in that sense, it's a little bit more conservative, you could say, than the traditional revolutionary kind of model. 
Uh, we're in, this, in, a, in a way where we probably should qualify to be consistent, what we're saying, I think both that, that these, these monuments to neoliberalism are in fact revolutionary, they are in fact the infrastructures that are meant to sustain the neoliberal revolution and to perpetuate it in its ongoing development. So mm. uh, an architecture does, in its temporality, I think, operate always in a, in a kind of deferral and, and, and at the same time perpetuation uh, of uh, things. Yeah. But maybe your question also about housing as being the blind spot, uh, I think it, it might have also to do, and maybe also with Boeri's uh, problem, uh. If, we, if we understand housing as that simple housing, right? As something which is not the city, right? And I think I mean this is something uh, which I find crucial to understand the concerns of housing, not not an angle sense of, uh, of yeah. the kind of the, the, the solution of the housing problem, but as as a quality, right? Uh, which, oh, sure. which contains urban life. Yeah. So it's yeah. it's not the provision of that thing. So that it actually it, it's it's a complex answer, right? And that's why. I guess a, a high rise with a few trees or <laughs> that make it, it's just not enough. It just con it doesn't constitute that. Or, I mean, although modernism, there are projects which think that in one building one can have that city, but it's, it's, it's a Can problem. Yeah. Yeah. One more thing, because you know, we did a little thing that uh, in Venice with, with, that Stefano was part of uh, about housing, and he showed that project. And I read it in a way, I think related to yours, that, that and he, of course, wants to argue that it's about ecology and, and, and a certain kind of post-sustainability kind of practice. Um, but the, uh, there is, a, 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 as it were, practical political dimension to this. Historically, environmentalist discourse has structurally been used to displace, uh, you know, more deeper forms of contestation. Nixon invented, he, he set up the EPA in the United States precisely to split the left uh, and, and to give, in a sense, uh, a, a channel for, for the less radical uh, ecologists uh, and, to, and to split the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement and so on. And, and so, you know, I, I take, uh, you know, the, 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 it, we, we, the, the response could be that, no, 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 this is always going to be about housing. In fact, the planet is, is itself an oikos that, that is being contested as we speak and, and needs to be discussed and not, not sort of made happy and nice, <laughs> you know. To the gentleman waiting very patiently there. Sorry. Uh, he had a question. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Thank you. Um, the first piece, I think it should be probably going to be a sort of comments and a question. Um, you know, the, the, the main question today is, says, how is ar architecture is political? How is architecture is political? I mean, this question also, I think, uh, engaged with the, with the role of the architecture in the contra-hegemonic struggle, I guess. You know, we've been actually defining uh, how, in what sense, we need to say revolutionary architecture. Uh, I think in that in that in that case, um, uh, I believe um, it's very important to define also how architecture became part of the, this uh, constructing counter hegemonic culture. Okay, we're talking about housing, but what sort of housing we're we talking about? Collective sense, you know, um, reducing individualism, consumer cultures, and so on. So um, I think how we can define, you know, architecture is a part of the, this process. And also, where is the role of the architecture in, in let's say, so-called global historical bloc? Um, if you look at that, you know, there is subgroups, excluded identities already challenging um, uh, neoliberal hegemonic culture, you know, around the world. So in what sense architecture plays role uh, in this bloc? Or are they in that? Um, uh, my second question will be, uh, Professor Chantal Mouffe, um, you clearly actually uh, um, explain uh, we need to make division between radical democracy as a project and uh, agonistic approach as a theoretical framework. Uh, and then uh, since we're talking about spaces and architecture, I was also wondering how can we uh, adopt an uh, um, agonistic approach into the non-Western spaces? You know, the, the, the society has got different civilization, but successfully adopted neoliberal uh, economy as well as neoliberal democratic system, and which became also the hegemonic uh, uh, power uh, in the society where it operates. So in this case, how we can actually, for instance, you know, I can actually maybe name it, Latin America, uh, particularly Asia, 
perhaps maybe Turkey, India, or, or Japan, uh, how can we use uh, agonistic approach to re-articulate these hegemonic cultures already, um, as uh, you always you know, uh, mentioned, there is, as Thatcher also says, there is no alternative. Now, in these countries also, the neoliberal uh, economic system as well as neoliberal democracy adopted successfully, but it became also there is no alternative as well. So how can we actually use your theoretical framework for, uh, or perhaps implement to the non-Western societies, which uh, again, you know, it has to be democratic institution, what you mentioned. There is democratic institution, there is adaptation. What is wrong adaptation? Is there any alternative for these non-Western societies? Uh, well, uh, you, you mentioned Latin America, but Latin America is not a non-Western society. I mean, in fact, uh, my model is very much uh, 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 popular in, in Latin America, in, in, part, uh, in, in, uh, um, <laughs> in Argentina, for instance, the president, uh, Christina Kirchner, said that she's a fan of my work, and she is... Uh, <laughs> uh, so, no, no but, but Latin America is is, uh, 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 in fact, um, it, 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 it's, it's funny, but uh, uh, I, I, I was ca kind of, I would say, curious to, when she, but then I un understand why she's, uh, you know, so keen on my work, because in, in one of, of, uh, of discussions, she was accused that she was not uh, 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 democratic because she was not uh, trying to build consensus, and she and she said, "You don't understand anything about <laughs> democracy. Read Chantal Mou, and you will know that democracy is not about consensus, but about dissensus." <laughs> so, but 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 you know, that, that is, uh, Latin America is is uh, 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 well. The, the, I have a student from Lebanon who is trying to. Uh, 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 frame Lebanese politics in terms of agonism. Uh, I'm kind of interested, I'm a bit, you know, suspicious, uh, but, but I don't know. Uh, but definitely uh, uh, the question is that you will need to have, uh, um, I mean, to, to use agonism in my understanding, eh, because there are other understanding, you, you will need to have this kind of democratic institution uh, and, and uh, uh, um, well, for instance, uh, uh, um, let's say, the, 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 in some cases, the question, we, we need, my, my insistence on the need to, 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 to uh, 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 develop the agonistic dimension is very much something which I have elaborated as a consequence of my criticism of the, you know, what I call the post-political situation in which there is no basic difference between the center right, the center left, and I say, well, what is called to the post-democracy? And I say, well, this is not good. And, and some people are saying, well, this is wonderful for democracy because no, you know, democracy has become more mature. And, uh, and, and I've, in fact, there is already a long time since I'm saying this is not good, it's a danger for democracy because it creates the terrain for development of right-wing uh, mm -hmm. populism. By the way, another little digression. Uh, 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 at, uh, during that time, people, because I, I, I began by uh, uh, my reflection on right-wing populism on the basis of the situation in Austria and the rise of Gork either. And, but then, of course, I saw that it was the same in France. And people were saying, well, but you know, Britain is a counterexample because we are the, the place where uh, this kind of third way politics was born, and we don't have right wing populism. And I was saying, no, so far sure. not, so far not. Uh, but all the conditions are right in, 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 in uh, 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 the UK for development of right wing populism. Okay, so we've got it now with, with UKIP, yeah. you know, so it's a. Uh, um, but so it, it, it is uh, basically, I think, uh, it, it was thinking in order how to reinject some kind of you know, vigor in, 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 in uh, uh, a democracy that had become too consensual. But in some cases, uh, for instance, I, I'm taking the problem of uh, 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 Tunisia, for instance. Uh, um, well, the problem there is not uh, uh, to put more agonism, because the question there is to create the basis for some kind of consensus. You know, so it's, it's, it's not a recipe that that, that yeah. is, uh, in, when you've got too much consensus, then you need to put agonism. But when, when you don't have a basic consensus, what you need is to create some, some framework for consensus. So it, it is something which, it depends very much of, of, of the context. And certainly, if you don't have the basic democratic institution, then you should not think in terms of, you know, agonistic politics. 
just add some more things, because I'm working uh, on Turkey. I'm also I'm working yeah. on a former student. And, uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to adapt your theoretical framework into the Turkey politics because mm -hmm. the country is already really polar, uh, polarized and uh, there is uh, there is certain consensus I guess that have been trying to be uh, part of the Europe uh, uh, almost you know 50 years uh, still they're waiting as a candidate um, so there is some sort of democratic institution and as well as you know um, recently they are economically doing very well as well so uh, in this in that case um, but that is very polarized society, you know, that, that, there is no any way to consensus between these different groups. You know, there is Alevis, there is Islamists, there is secular Kemalists, and there is Kurds as well. So those groups, uh, since, you know, the, the Turkey is established uh, after the post-Ottoman society uh, and post-Ottoman uh, era, there is no way to these groups to become consensus. But there is some consensus, at least you know, democratic institutions works somehow, you know, sometimes good, sometimes bad, but still it works. So, but it's not European countries. I think I meant then non-Western, perhaps maybe European. Uh, uh, in this case, the, but there is actually no liberal uh, policies. It works very well in Turkey now. Capitalism is uh, successfully adopted now. Uh, there is uh, very good uh, textile and construction industries happening and so on and so on. So that's why, you know, the recent AKP government, uh, so-called conservative Democrat, uh, they're not even called themselves like Christian Democrats. They're not calling themselves Islamic Democrats. They, they call themselves conservative, conserv conservative Democrats. So in this case, we have some certain base in there. So can we actually really adopt it? Because now uh, Kurdish uh, struggle, Kurdish political movement use radical democracy very often. And they even adopted these into the Rojava, Syria, uh, before they fight in against the ISIS. So therefore, there is a constitution based on the radical democracy, and uh, uh, the, the captures leader Öcalan's using, you know, your radical democracy uh, perfectly well for the, for the Kurds to offer even, not Turkey, a Middle East as a project that they actually challenge nation states because they says this is the, the, the cause of the problems because we have actually uh, Kurds, as you know, uh, 40 million people around the world without any nation states. They are the, one of the maybe big uh, majority uh, nation without any state. So they say the problem is, uh, is nationalism and as well as nation state and, and also capitalism. So therefore they adopted radical democracy. They created a canton system in Rojava and Syria and now uh, trying to uh, preserve this system uh, in the Syria. So that, therefore, there is a radical democracy somehow uh, is, is, is adopting, but what about agonistic democracy? You know, can we talk about this? No, I don't think, I mean, this is not really the topic of, of our uh, uh, no. encounter. Well, I, 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 uh, um, I look, very, very, very uh, shortly, I think that the problem in Turkey is that the, there is no, the, the opposition to the AKP is not able to constitute itself uh, uh, the, as, 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 as an uh, forces that that will be uh, uh, really uh, in, in, in condition to, to is they are not uh, uh, um, strong enough. I mean, they, they are groups. I, I know a little bit about Turkey, so I know that they are group of people who really represent some kind of more, you know, uh, left wing alternative. But they are they are not strong enough. So it's a question of building. The, 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 there, is no, there is no recipe. You know, you, you can't just say, okay, that this is the, the well. In order to have, I think the, ins the, the institution are are there so far. I mean, let's hope that they are not going to be more undermined by the, the politics of uh, Erdogan. But um, you need to have uh, uh, other, an alternative. There is no real serious alternative in terms of you know, having the political force in Turkey to, to be an alternative to Erdogan. That's a problem. So people should organize in order to try to create that. But you know, this is my take time and, and this is, you can't really, uh, it's a problem for you know, the Turk to resolve. You, there, there is not a political th uh, theory that can tell you this is the recipe to follow, I'm sorry, but th that's not the, the, the way, you know, it works. There was another question over there. Um. Um, I'd like to start this by going back to Ines's work with the Russian paper architects. At the start of that uh, phenomenon, um, 
Sasha Rappaport, a Moscow critic, wrote uh, an essay for the 1987 uh, Milan Triennale, which was republished by the AA, uh, in which I think it was called uh, Utopia and Fantasy. And I think he described the work of paper architects as not utopian, but uh, uh, an architecture of fantasy. And it seems to me that this um, opens two separate lines of thought. The first is, if that is so, and if the architects in the dissension were in an area that Rappaport called fantasy rather than utopia, then what, um, what reserve value can, can, we, can, we, uh, can we assign to that area of imaginative freedom that does not take a directly programmatic form of a utopian project? And secondly, uh, following the line of utopia, which has not been mentioned here tonight, um, it seems to me that the issue that begins to emerge as I'm listening to you is what form of direct design can political uh, program in architecture take if it is not utopian? Um, because it seems to me that the last time that uh, a fully political uh, architecture was undertaken, not as the object of politics, but as the subject of politics, uh, was in the early 20th century in a utopian form. Um, utopia is, as it were, the architectural deduction from uh, power uh, of an ideal form. Uh, it is as if it were uh, we were following that uh, uh, proverb, uh, man proposes, God disposes. Likewise, an architect might propose, but it's power that disposes. Uh, and power creates, first of all, laws, and the laws are then translated into walls. So the issue then becomes, uh, other than this ideology of consensus, which I think Pierre, Louis, uh, uh, Pierre Vittorio described very well, what other kind of um, activity can architects undertake um, which is not utopian um, and is, is not simply fulfilling an existing consensus? Would anyone like to take that? I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll say something about utopia since I've had something. <coughs> I feel compelled. That Do I have that ghost again? You know, um, I, I, I suppose, Brian, that I, I'm, my response is to, is, uh, to appreciate the formulation, but to try to, to reformulate the question in a sense. Because, of course, you know, all that you're saying is, is taken, in a sense, more for granted in, you know, not just in, in, in the way that we pose many of our questions today about architecture, politics, society, and so on, but, but the way that we teach it, uh, the way, the kind of historical narratives that are constructed in, in lecture courses, for example, and as well as the way we, uh, we write about it. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I, I would, let's say, just move the question of utopia not into uh, you know, into the realm of ideal cities and, and, and you know, authoritarian plans and, and that sort of thing, which has, in a sense, become the trope, uh, but into uh, what I think is a more properly discursive register uh, in which the function of the term, as it really, you know, in Foucault's sense, as a pattern of statements, what we're describing is a discourse, um, a pattern of statements that enable certain thoughts and, and perhaps even uh, disable others. Uh, and and the... the, the um, the relevant function, for me at least, in, in terms of your question, is to, uh, to, as it were, find ways of conjuring what I would like to call utopia's ghost, not utopia itself as such in, in some uh, sort of reified form, but, but the, the, the possibility of structural change. Such, as, such that such a possibility become thinkable and discussable t so that we can actually have a, a properly political argument about uh, what constitutes 
you, you know, this or that uh, concrete um, possibility to this or that, in, in this or that situation. Uh, so, uh, so rather than the idealist understanding of utopia, I, for that I would effectively substitute a materialist one uh, that is, is, in a sense, um, uh, takes this figure, to, to use the terms that you used earlier, Chantal, ontically uh, and performatively. Um, as, you know, so for example, what we might do, you know, as teachers is to, to go back through these, this tradition that we're, we know about and, and, and reread the drawings all the way up to, you know, mm -hmm. and also to globalize it. Because I do have to say, I wanna, in, in, in terms of the previous question, that, that the Eurocentrism of our conversation is, you know, needs to be interrupted. So you're completely right. And we could go, it'd be very, very interesting to talk about many other uh, examples uh, that don't fit uh, the mold. I mean, I think we, we talking about Turkish politics is, a, is an opening onto a whole other set of questions, um, but maybe that's for later. But um, it shouldn't be, in fact, because it always is for later, isn't it? Uh, so, so for example, I'll try to just. To, to, I know we have to wrap up, so I'll try to to connect. Um, there are society that in, mo in most of the world. This question is not a question. It's, it's a problem for Anglo America, basically, the the failure of utopia, and it's all over, and end of history, and all of this. Um, partly because in, in many discursive environments, uh, it just hasn't been posed. That, like I, the, um, the one that I know a little bit about is the Indian one in which for, for a post-colonial society, the master plan, which is one of the figures that, that is, is uh, you know, often cited as, as representative of the end of everything, um, is, is structurally necessary first to get out of, from under the yoke of colonial power. In fact, it's in, in the case of India, it was the British technique that was, that, that was appropriated. It was New Delhi that, uh, you know, the master planning of that city uh, that was meant to, to, to um, the movement of the capital from Calcutta to, uh, to New Delhi was, 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 was a way for the, for the colonial powers to, uh, to, to diffuse uh, the, um, uh, the contestation of colonial rule that was happening in Calcutta. So the, the literally planning and building the capital was, was a colonial project. Uh, but then the planning of, of not just housing, but universities, uh, you know, hospitals, infrastructures of all kinds, it, you know, actually in a very kind of dramatically modernist and heroic way that we would today probably call utopian, was structurally part of the, of, of the both nationalist and uh, anti-colonial and, and, and in the case of India, more or less socialist project or at least social democratic project. Um, you know, in the 50s and 60s. So, and many architects who then were then later, I think, mislabeled as critical regionalists were really the protagonists in, in, that, in that project. There are a lot of problems with, with, uh, with the consequent uh, buildings and, and, you know, and plans where we can go one by one and, and break them down and do all kinds of interesting uh, things with them. But, but to simply rule all of that out as, as not, you know, as it were, available to the historical imagination, which is to say the imagination of the future uh, is, is, is a, a, a absolutely brutal and un, unexcusable act, I think, uh, pedagogically and discursively. So, so, so let me just uh, wrap up some wrap up remarks. Um, I have to say, surprisingly, there's quite a lot of uh, consensus, I think, um, in the sense that uh, I think there's, there's a, a lot of agreement on the, on the uh, architectural thought as, in, in a sense, perfectly attuned to the model of agonism. The idea of the project, the idea of the war of positions, I think, I think there's a lot of agreement and hopefully this is the beginning of a, a conversation in which we can continue to pick at, pick at the disagreements. Um, and so, so, yeah, there has to be a, an end and uh, I'm gonna be the decider here, so the political moment and, and uh, call, call it. <laughs> um, thank you very much to everybody.